Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Business of America and the Consumer Economy in the, of the 1920s, an online professional development seminar sponsored by America in Class from the Net. I'm Richard Tram. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, let me just take a minute to introduce the National Humanities Center. We're located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, and we are the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. What that simply means is that we're a private nonprofit organization. We run a fellowship program that brings scholars from this country and abroad to the center, usually for an academic year, to research and, and write on topics in the humanities, subjects like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978. About 1,300 scholars have worked here since then, and about 1,300 books have been produced as a result of research done here. Now that may make the place sound like an ivory tower, and you see it looks like an ivory tower, but the founders didn't want it to be an ivory tower. They wanted it to connect with a wide array of audiences, and they're particularly interested in connecting with teachers. And we do that in a variety of ways. You can find out how we do that by going to americainclass.org. That will take you to this page, and from this page, you will be able to get to all of the programs and services and resources we provide for teachers. Now, when this seminar is over this evening, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm, I got my, my slides got mixed up here on me. I want to point out something that we have just begun. It's called America in Class Lessons. Here you will find historical documents and literary texts and visual images on American history and literature set up for teaching through close reading. It's the America in Class Lessons, it is particularly useful if you happen to be teaching under the Common Core State Standards. Now then, I can tell you that at the end of the seminar, you can go to the Business of America and the Consumer Economy of the 1920s page, the website from which you obtained your readings, and there you will find a recording of the seminar, the PowerPoint, and also an evaluation. Feel free to plunder the PowerPoint, use it in your classes, that's what it's there for. And the evaluation, please click on that, fill it out online and submit it to us. It's very important, we pay attention to those. And once we receive that, we will send you a, a letter that will document your participation in the seminar, and you'll be able to present that letter to your local certifying authorities to get whatever recertification credit the, the, uh, your participation <coughs> in the seminar warrants. Now, uh, the way the seminar will work this evening, uh, our uh, leader, Ed Ballasine, will make some remarks key to a presentation of slides from time to time. We will focus on excerpts from text and we will analyze them. And you can participate in the seminar through questions and comments, <clears throat> and we hope you will, by putting your cursor in the uh, box that you see there marked, I've bracketed in green, it's at the lower right hand side of your screen. Type your question or comment, hit the send button to the right, and your message will appear in the chat box above. I will be following the chat all evening, and I'll be bringing it into the conversation at appropriate moments. So let's get underway. We have two goals this evening. First, we're going to explore the connections between mass production and the creation of mass consumerism and its long-term implications for the structures of American business. And we're also going to introduce some enduring ideas about corporate strategy, American business institutions, and modes of regulating American business that emerged in the 1920s. And we had some really good questions on the seminar forum. How did the emergence of a consumer society figure into the rural-urban divide that played such a prominent role in other issues in the 1920s, like prohibition? Were the consumer economy and the credit buying that made it possible essentially an urban, a urban phenomenon? How did people in the 1920s respond to the increase of financial wealth generated by the stock market and that, produ and that produced by the real manufacturing economy? What happened to progressivism in the 1920s? How does the consumer economy of the 1920s relate to the corporate consolidation of the late 19th and early 20th centuries? How did the consumer economy of the 1920s set the stage for the Great Depression? What are the benefits and drawbacks of an economy heavily dependent on consumer spending? 
And how does today's consumer economy compare with that of the 1920s? Now, we had a question in there about the Great Depression. And before we get underway, I want to make a plug for our, an upcoming seminar. If uh, you would like to find out more about the Great Depression, sign up for the causes of the Great Depression, which will run from 7 to 8.30 on March 14th. It will be led by Colin Gordon of the University of Iowa. We'll be talking a little bit about the Great Depression tonight, but not a great deal. If you want to learn more about it, I urge you to sign up for our seminar on March 14th. Now, we are very pleased to have with us this evening Edward Ballasine, the Associate Professor of History and Public Policy at Duke University and a National Humanities Center Fellow. Ed was here in 2009-10 working on that book you see at the bottom of the <coughs> slide, Suckers, Swindlers, and an Ambivalent State, A History of Business Fraud in America. He has written widely on legal history, business history, and the history of policy. So let me turn the program over to Ed right now. Let me find his name here on our list. There it is, and I will turn it over to Ed. Okay, Ed, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Richard, and welcome to everyone. Um, really looking forward to this opportunity to talk about these issues with you. Uh, had a chance to read over the forum, the comments that the, the uh, participants have uh, contributed to over the last uh, several days, and I was I was struck by one comment um, from uh, seminar participant Clooney Brown, who observed that much of our current world is rooted in the 1920s. You know, I, I would really agree with that observation, and in, in many ways, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk tonight about at least some of the ways uh, that the enduring characteristics of the American economy and, and the relations of uh, the federal government and, and uh, American business have their, their origins uh, in this decade. And there, there are four big themes that we're going to investigate uh, 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 this evening. Uh, the, the, first, the first key theme uh, that, that I want to uh, stress is uh, the extent and sources of manufacturing productivity in the 1920s. Uh, and and uh, um, uh, related uh, to that, the tremendous uh, power of, of mass consumption that, that uh, was a, a companion to mass production. The second big theme uh, involves the challenge uh, of creating that mass consumption, uh, consumption of fostering uh, sufficient demand to find outlets for the goods pouring out of American factories. Uh, the third key theme uh, involves the challenge of integrating these two things, mass production on the one hand with mass consumption on the other, and the implications of that challenge for uh, the, the evolution of corporate organization and strategy in the United States. And then finally, uh, we're going to discuss the development of a, a particular style of government business relations uh, that uh, had first and foremost a promotional ethos, a goal of, of fostering economic growth, but also, and, and here this is a, a distinctive aspect uh, that I think one can date to the 1920s, although certainly they're precursors, of, uh, of concern for stabilizing conditions in particular industries, especially through mechanisms of business self-regulation. So each of these uh, four themes involves the nature of modern American economic institutions and political institutions uh, to some extent. Uh, th this is a particular research focus of mine, but I also think that it's really crucial to understanding, uh, it's really crucial to understand along with uh, the shifting nature of, uh, of American cultural values and the dynamics of, uh, of social experience in the United States. Uh, these institutional arrangements that emerged in the 1920s cast a very long shadow over the United States. Um, and so I'm going to conclude at the end with some brief observations about how, uh, how exactly that has been the case, uh, suggesting, I hope, the value of macro-historical thinking, of, of, of seeing connections over the long term uh, in addition to digging into close readings of a key document or intensive engagement with a particular historical moment uh, or period. I also, uh, along the way, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how to integrate statistical evidence and qualitative evidence uh, as, as, as teaching strategies. So, so let's get going. Uh, and, and let's begin with uh, a discussion of the remarkable performance of American manufacturing in the 1920s. 
Uh, so let me, let me just start with, uh, with a couple of uh, graphs. So uh, he, this is a graph that shows uh, manufacturing production in the United States uh, from 1920 uh, up through the Great Depression. I want you to focus for the moment just on that period of the 1920s. Uh, and I'd like to ask everyone uh, just to sort of, you know, anyone who might, might want to contribute by a chat, you know, what seems to be really uh, dramatically significant about this graph in the 1920s. Let's take a second, see if anyone has. Okay. Uh, well, what seems to, to be it's, It almost doubles. I don't see the PowerPoint of it. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Uh, boom and bust, yeah, from 28 down to the basement in 32. Quickly increases in the 20s. Okay. Yeah, especially in the 20s. 32, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then a, then a sharp decline exactly. Now, now have a look at this second slide, and again focus particularly on that period from uh, the just right after World War One up through uh, to the the Great Crash in 1929. Uh, any any uh, any I'd like to uh, again uh, welcome comments about what's distinctive about that that segment of the graph. Okay, let's see what's significant World War to uh, healing, yeah, we came out of World War II. Uh, boom and bust, huge increase around the 40s, huge dip in the 30s. Okay, we had. Wow, let, uh, we, before we on, I don't want to lose this question, Ed. Um, so let's keep it in mind. How much is the boom of the 1920s a result of the fact that the U.S. didn't have to fight a world war on its own soil? So let's address the point you raised, and then come back to that question about World War One. Well, I'll, I'll take the question first. Uh, I mean, I think that obviously uh, mattered mattered quite a quite a bit. Uh, the United States was in a much stronger position uh, in terms of its uh, its fiscal situation as compared to uh, to its European peers. Of course, on the other hand, there, there's the, uh, the the need to rebuild after war, which can be an enormous stimulus to economic output. So one has to keep that in mind as well. The thing I would stress about this, about this graph is that the actual number of people working in manufacturing isn't really going up. Mm -hmm. It's pretty flat. So with the with a, you've got this massive uh, growth in manufacturing output, and yet not many more people working in manufacturing. That's an indication of extraordinary productivity gains. So that the economy, at least in its manufacturing segment, was was far more uh, far more productive. In fact, you have rates of growth that were more than five percent uh, real growth annually from 1921 to 1929. That's uh, not that far off from what China has been ex exhibiting in, in the last several decades. Very rapid rates of growth, but no increase in manufacturing employment. So the, that, that presents a puzzle, how to explain that, how to account for this extraordinary productivity. One popular uh, explanation involves the impact of scientific management. And this, this, this approach uh, often focuses on uh, the figure of Frederick W. Taylor uh, and the way in which uh, he, he advocated remaking processes of industrial labor. Um, I'm curious whether uh, the extent to which uh, participants are familiar with this this interpretation. It's, it's common in many textbooks. Hey, how many folks are familiar with uh, Taylorism, scientific management? Okay, we got some there. Okay, time motion studies. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, AP, it's required in AP US, and from the yes, it was a progressive part of the progressive micromanagement. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's safe to say lots of folks have heard of scientific management, and and, and the origins of this, of course, are earlier and in, in uh, coming out of the the uh, uh, first couple of decades of the of the twentieth century. Um, so, I would argue actually that one can easily overstate this emphasis on on Taylorism, especially the parts of it that involve time motion studies and the attempt to increase the efficiency of labor through engineers going to workplaces and trying to impose new kinds of routines on, on manual workers. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this, this image of the, of the uh, German worker Schmidt, who, who's moving pig iron from point A to point B in, in Taylor's most famous book on scientific management, um, that kind of thing really was not what was going on in terms of this massive increase in productivity. Uh, in the in the 1920s, um, and and part of that reason is because of the depth of resistance from from industrial workers uh, to time motion studies and and the basic approach of Taylorism 
which they viewed as, uh, as in many cases, as an affront to their dignity. I just thought I'd uh, read one quote here from a Providence machinist uh, who, who described being photographed in 1913. Uh, he said, cameras to the front of them, cameras to the rear, cameras to the right, cameras to the left, pictures taken of every move so as to eliminate false moves and drive the worker into a stride that would, not, that would be as mechanical as the machine he tends. If the tailorizers only had an apparatus that could tell what the mind of the worker was thinking, they would probably develop a greater efficiency by making them cut out all thoughts of their being men. So, so this is not a this this view was really widely held amongst uh, uh, industrial workers, and it, it limited the impact of this version of Taylorism. What was much more significant uh, were were a sort of broader kind of Taylorism uh, that was associated with the electrification of factories. Now, so this is a slide that shows you uh, what was going on in the transition from the use of water power and steam power. Uh, over to electric power uh, within American manufacturing. And you can see that there's a sort of steady growth uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the, the slope of this, of this line that's electric. But this is a, um, this is, this, this, if you look at the left side of this graph, you'll see that these are powers, 10 to the power, 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1. So this is actually a much more substantial and quick rise uh, than just the straight line would suggest. Uh, so you have you have a situation uh, here in which uh, you've got a, a move to a much more efficient mode of uh, of power, um, which created the possibility of reimagining factory production and reorganizing it systemically. Uh, this is this is a, a, dy a dynamic that uh, a local, that uh, uh, contemporary observers uh, uh, paid very close attention to. This is a, an example of a uh, an article from Chicago that was closely tracking just how much, uh, what percentage of, of manufacturing in the uh, region had, had uh, embraced electrification and taking great pride in the extent to which this was uh, uh, happening at a, a, a rap, more rapid rate than, than elsewhere in the country. There's an ethos of boosterism associated with this. Now, now it's not I just could, that. Yeah, yeah, if I could just interrupt quickly, <clears throat> we have a question here that takes us back a little bit to Taylorism. Did Taylor ever account for the safety costs involved by speeding up machines and, and things like that? Uh, so, so not not so much. No, the the and, and also or just speeding up the rate at which people people worked. Uh -huh. uh, industrial workers had a strong notion of the stint, which was the speed or pace of work that you could maintain and sustain over not just an hour or a day or a month, but rather a career, a, 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 a decades of working in an industrial workplace. Um, and they had rules of thumb about that, uh, a sense of what was appropriate, what was, what was, uh, what, what, what individuals could actually maintain, uh, without, without developing injuries, without making mistakes that, that could cost them, uh, their, Leg or their arm or their lives, uh, and this this is not a perspective that that Taylor particularly uh, had much had much interest in in exploring. Okay, and a, and a quick question here: Did did uh, uh, businesses uh, worry about whether it was AC or DC current? Would that matter? Uh, there, there, that, yes, that did matter, and oh. and uh, there was a there was a shift from 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 one to the other that was contested at the time. People argued about which one would make more sense. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, I have a tendency to mix these up, but I'm pretty sure that it was it was alternating current that went out as uh, as the, the sort of standard. Okay. Um, and we have another question here about electrification. <clears throat> um, is it true that uh, some businesses got power, but the neighborhoods uh, of the workers did not get power in their homes? Is that true? So, so that's a great question. And initially, the focus was very much on on uh, electrifying uh, 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 industrial consumers that that had a huge demand for for electricity, uh, because of course the thing about electricity is you can't store it. So once you can produce it, you need to be able to send it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And insofar as um, neighborhoods were electrified, it is absolutely the case that uh, upper class neighborhoods and middle class neighborhoods got service uh, before uh, working class. Uh, neighborhoods did. Nonetheless, as we're going to see, 
the the the, the electrification of of homes and neighborhoods uh, also mattered enormously to this growth in 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 uh, manufacturing efficiency. I'm going to talk about more about that in just a, in a couple minutes. Okay. Did that have a psychological effect on the workers? Uh, their factories were electrified, but they went home to the dark. Uh, it certainly would have would have created some some uh, set of expectations and a, a sense of, of differential treatment. Mm -hmm. So okay. so so the the key element that I would stress here about um, the systemic reorientation of manufacturing in the United States, the, the the crucial piece of this is the emergence of the assembly line as a mode of of production for consum consumer dur durables. Uh, so here we have some images of the assembly line. Uh, this, is, this is from the Ford Motor Company, which was uh, the, the, the key innovator with respect to this. What you have in place here is a fundamental rethinking of manufacturing. Uh, the, 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 the integration of a, a process of having uh, particular pieces of a larger manufactured good arriving just in time to be uh, 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 assembled into a, a chassis or some other component of the car and then and then put together uh, into a final product. Uh, and what's, what's crucial here is that instead of having an engineer with a watch standing over someone and telling them how to move or, or how to somehow increase uh, the efficiency of, of moving goods from point A to point B, you now have the substitution of an enormous amount of capital and, and a, a, a cutting edge technology for a lot of that labor. Uh, so you have gravity slides and a moving line. And then you've got the further point that the speed of the line is now regulating the pace of, of work. Uh, and if, and it, it, it massively simplified things from the perspective of supervisors, of foremen. How could they decide whether someone was a good enough worker or not? It was very simple. Could they keep up? If they could keep up, they had a job. If they couldn't, they'd find somebody else. So the difference between this and scientific management would be that scientific management focused on the individual worker. The assembly line focused on the entire plant. That's right. And in fact, I would, also, I would actually call this scientific management, but oh, one that was okay. far more, a version of it that was far more significant in, in reconstituting the nature of American manufacturing work. Okay. We have a question that goes back to electrification. Um, how did electrification affect the settlement patterns in urban environments? Um, so, so the it, it made possible uh, a uh, lots and lots of things. So you could you could now have um, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that this went hand in hand with a process of zoning. This is another form of, of, of regulation that, that people don't uh, often think about in this period, but it's the 19-teens, the 1920s, when cities really begin to imagine reorganizing their urban space and having a clear separation of, res often, in many cases, of residential neighborhoods and manufacturing. Um, so this is part of what's going on at the time, and, and electrification is, is, is bound up with that, at that process. Right. Did electrification and the advent of trolley cars uh, bring about the suburbs? Very much so. And of course, this is a process that goes back into the 18, 1870s with railway lines. But um, one of the things that happens to urban transport is it itself is electrified in this period. I see. Uh, which, which dramatically increases um, the efficiency of the, of the systems. It, they, those systems uh, expand outward, so you have a, 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 the growth of these metropolitan areas the capacity of people to live further away from, from their places of work. Right. All of this is going on at the same time. Okay, we have a couple of questions here about the assembly line. First of all, how did they decide how fast the line should go? So there's a lot of trial and error in that. Um, a lot of it had to do with what people could take. You make the line go, you know, you can make the, you can speed the line up so quickly as one can notice from modern times. Uh, and the, Somebody referred to that movie. Uh, the, the movie with Charlie Chaplin. Right. Uh, or, or you can think of the I Love Lucy episode. <laughs> with, with Somebody the, referred to that as well. <laughs> um, you know, that, that you speed it up enough and nobody can cope. So this was something that engineers with, with stopwatches actually did pay attention to and then tried to calibrate. Now, they also were attempting to hit the limit. And try, there, were, there were definitely lots of, of moments where uh, under uh, – particular competitive pressures, uh, there would be 
a request to the, the line foreman to speed up the line to see mm -hmm. if the workers could tolerate a little bit more. Right. Uh, but in many cases, it was a trial and error profit, pr process. It's, it's hard to overstate the massive gains in pro productivity associated with this um, development. Uh, this sequencing of manufacturing process and, and breaking everything up into very simple uh, tasks. You, you might have literally the job you'd have all day long would be just doing one thing like placing motor pans one on each side under the chassis frame. That would be two men or four men who would have a different task of tightening the motor pan nuts and placing split pins into the nuts. That would be all you would do all day long. The, the growth in productivity was enormous. So just to give you an, a, a couple of measures of that, from 1908 to 1915, the time that it took to assemble a car dropped from 12 and a half hours to two hours. Wow. So you had productivity gains of 400 to 600% associated with, the, with this transformation, just mm -hmm. absolutely extraordinary, which is what, was it, what enabled Ford to continue to cut the price of the car. Can we have another? We have a question there about Ford. Why had others not perfected the assembly line like Ford? What enabled him to perfect it? That's a great question. Um, you know, so there were precursors. Um, one could look to the canning industry, which had many aspects of this moving process by the uh, early 20th century. Uh, perhaps the best example of a really uh, powerfully integrated process wasn't about assembly, but rather disassembly, which was meatpacking, um, not particularly uh, taking apart hogs in Chicago. Uh -huh. um, nobody, nobody had, had, it wasn't, but I think the crucial thing here is that not just that it was um, something that nobody had had the idea of, it was, a, people had thought about it, but it was very complicated to get it to work in, it, with the specification, with, with the uh, enormous attention to detail that was, was required, mm -hmm. you also needed incredibly close attention to the standardization of parts so that everything would fit no matter which one came down the line. And while there was a, a big focus on uh, standardization in American manufacturing in some sectors like gun manufacturing in the mid to late 19th century, they didn't have anything like the, the, the tolerance levels that were necessary for this kind of, of endeavor. So the other thing I would just point out is just how much capital was required to pull off a full assembly line for something as complicated as an automobile. Right. It was a very daunting prospect. Right. Let's take one more question on Ford and the assembly and move ahead. Could you please explain the benefits to Henry Ford of the pay raise? I guess we're talking here about his his move when he raised, uh, raised his workers to $5 a day. <coughs> Was it just to keep them from unionizing, or was it to make them into consumers of his cars, or was it to uh, make up for the sheer boredom of the jobs? Okay, so I would really focus on, on the last. It's not that Ford wasn't uh, cognizant of the impact of turning his workers into consumers. That was not the initial motivation, the most important one. The most important initial motivation was that the turnover on the line was 400% a year. You uh -huh. couldn't get the average worker to stay more than, than uh, three months because the work was so incredibly alienating um, and, and so pressure filled. And because of that, you know, there were training, even though the, the, the jobs were, were semi-skilled, they did not take the enormous amounts of time to learn. And nonetheless, there were real training costs to having this incredible churn on the, of the workforce. Right. So the biggest goal of that $5 a day uh, wage was simply to get a a relatively stable workforce in the plant. Okay, and we will take one more question about Ford because it's a really good question. How did Ford capitalize the Ford Motor Company? Debt, equity, internally funded, how? So, so he initially had to, uh, had to borrow from bankers and he had to uh, also raise some, essentially some venture capital. He hated it. He yeah. absolutely detested the, the financial community in the United States and the, the power that, uh, that investment bankers had. Um, and his greatest, his greatest goal was to get free of them, which he managed, uh, I believe, by uh, uh, the, the late 19-teens. And from that point on, all of the constant technological innovation and the willingness even to scrap an entire plant, which was no longer really working, and build a whole new one, 
uh, you know, massive investment of funds. He did that out of out of reinvesting profits. Okay, we've got a few other questions here about Ford, and I've written them down. We'll save them if we have time at the end. But I really do think we should move ahead. So, so let's talk now a little bit about the second channel for uh, how electrification really mattered in the, in this period, um, and that that is about the theme that one of the uh, participants raised as a question: the electrification of homes. Uh, this this uh, infrastructural shift created some enormous new opportunities for, for manufacturers to imagine reconfiguring the basic nature of, of some, some uh, absolutely fundamental household activities, cooking, cleaning, uh, but, but also the nature of, of recre recreation. So we have some slides here that, that suggest this, uh, you know, some crucial new uh, products uh, and experiences of the of the 1920s, the vacuum cleaner, the washing machine, the radio, the movies. Um, all of these uh, reflect, uh, uh, you know, they're all predicated on, on, on electricity. They're, the, the electrification of the society is a crucial prerequisite for all of these, uh, for consumer appliances, and also for the communications revolution that emerged with radio and cinema. You needed power for all of these, uh, all of these new possibilities. Uh, they were also, also, these developments were predicated on a massive expansion of co corporate investment. Uh, there we go, one, one, hit, one too many there. Um, so we're talking here about uh, we're gonna, uh, firms like General Electric and uh, American Telegraph and Telephone uh, and Westinghouse. Uh, engaging in huge expenditures, and, and, and not just the expenditure of funds, but also the invention of what we now think of as research and development. So that means building physical infrastructure, laboratories like the ones you can see in the images here, also building up human capital, communities of scientists and engineers who are working together collaboratively in these laboratories, pursuing ideas that can translate into new kinds of products. Uh, and then once developing those those big ideas, refining them and developing actual prototypes and and uh, 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 products that that could be manufactured uh, uh, profitably. All of this is also going on uh, in collaboration increasingly with scientists and engineers uh, based in universities. So you know, I, I assigned as uh, as one of the readings for for this seminar a uh, corporate annual report from. Um, from, from AT&T that talks about this, uh, this investment um, in, in, uh, in, in technical development. It's a crucial element of what's going on here. Um, all right, so let's, let's shift now to a, 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 the second big theme for the, the seminar, uh, which involves a fundamental problem for all modern industrial economies. So you have now this new uh, uh, mode of, of production that, that has emerged uh, uh, that is enormously more productive than anything that had preceded it. Where are you going to find the dollars to buy up the goods coming out of these factories? Uh, lurking over this whole new uh, uh, business environment is the specter of overcapacity, of not being able to, to sell these goods and the result might be cratering prices and a vicious cycle of production cutbacks, uh, people thrown out of work, cratering demand. In short, the dilemmas of the late 19th and early 20th century business cycle, and then even more profoundly, uh, the eventual challenges posed by the Great Depression. So here's, here's at, at one level, a kind of structural backdrop for what, what emerged in the 1930s. I want to stress here, though, a more micro issue involving the dilemmas confronted by individual firms. Uh, the individual manufacturer who was, who was investing to such a large extent had sharp, uh, really sharp pressures to find a way of selling all of this output. Uh, and, and, and because of course, the whole approach is predicated on economies of scale. If you can produce enormous numbers of goods, you can make the marginal cost of, of each of these goods relatively uh, cheaply. 
this this but in order in order to get to that point you've got to be able to sell those enormous there's a, there's a sort of chicken and egg question if if you can if you can get the the purchases up to a high enough level then you can bring your production costs down so for firms throughout the manufacturing economy a hugely significant issue in the 1920s is how to sell really really big big issue one key element of this uh, of the approach that firms came up with involved advertising uh, and uh, you, you want to ignore the TV that's in the the box in the middle there in the third column uh, it's this is this these data are from a longer uh, a longer uh, 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 series of, of years that go into the the 1980s I've only given you a portion of it here so of course obviously no no television advertising uh, in 1929 or before not and really none to speak of before before the, the, the uh, post-World War II era. Um, nonetheless, what I want to stress here is the extent to which by the 1920s, advertising had, had become a multi-billion dollar industry, even in, in 1920 dollars. Uh, and, and, and this went along with the entrenchment of ad agencies uh, and the whole business of, uh, of marketing through advertising as a major institution of American life. I wanted to point out as well that um, for those teachers who are interested in having students work with um, advertisements from this era, one excellent place to go for material for student projects is um, at the uh, website of the Duke Special Collections Library. They have two major web archives that are filled with uh, both examples of advertising and also uh, quite a lot of marketing materials. Uh, uh, from 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 this this era, also uh, uh, before it and after it, if you want to track that over time. And we have a <clears throat> we have a question here. <clears throat> uh, just slipped past me. Let me get it here. Was it easier to get products to market back then as compared to now? I suspect it's easier now. I mean, we can take things from China and have them in the United States in a short time. But did this? boom in uh, productivity and in selling and in goods, what impact did that have on the distribution system? Did this, this produce a commensurate growth in roads and railroads and all that sort of thing? Uh, well, so you've got, you've got several things going on at this point. You have massive construction of urban transportation networks, so that's a lot of public investment in streetcars and subways in cities like New York. Streetcars much more important than trolleys uh, across the rest of the country, uh, but you've got elevated train systems in, in uh, in Chicago, you've got the, the the T in Boston. These are all being built uh, in this in this era. Um, you've got at the same time uh, the emergence of massive construction of roads, uh, and by the 1920s, the emergence as well of a of a trucking industry that's beginning to put pressure on railroads in a variety of ways. Um, so, so there's a real building out of the of the transportation networks. That's that's definitely going on concomitantly with these with these other developments, and that's that's a, that's a set of uh, of processes that were very powerfully dependent on public policy, public investment, uh, public uh, 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 taking of private property in order to produce this transportation infrastructure. Okay, good. Thank you. Shall we go on then? So, so I want to focus on. Uh, uh, could focus particularly on advertising, but I think a lot of textbooks already do that quite nicely. Um, I wanted to at, rather focus on three features of the 1920s selling effort uh, that might be a little bit uh, uh, less familiar to, uh, to the participants in the seminar. None of these three features were unprecedented. Uh, uh, but they all extended really quite dramatically, and it were extended quite dramatically in the 1920s. So the first, the first is the institution of installment credit that I want to I want to really focus on. Um, I, and I want to throw out a question to the participants about why this, why they think this might have been an especially important issue in the 1920s. Okay, <clears throat> why was installment credit an especially important issue in the 1920s? Any takers on that one? Any takers, <clears throat> because earnings were dropping. Yeah, you needed to spread out the cost of things because higher cost of the new product. Yeah, yeah, because stock, because of buying stocks on margin. 
the appearance of prosperity in one's home, the degree we were all still farmers, revenue came in certain times of the year. That's a good point. And I want to come back to that because that refers to one of our uh, in the from the forum questions. Uh, has the ability to raise had the ability to raise the standard of living? Okay, we got some good response there. Steady employment, less risk, fueled by credit. Okay, lots of items to buy, installment buying being allowed them to do so more easily. Okay, what do you make of those responses? So, so a couple of things. So if you're focusing on rural populations, and this, this involves a couple of the questions that came through in the forum, uh, you know, the 1920s were not the greatest time in the United States. It was, there was quite a bit of, of uh, building financial distress in the countryside. And, and so although there, there certainly was quite a lot of uh, purchase of particularly automobiles in rural America, uh, and, and, and it's not as if uh, rural, the rural uh, 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 population was not partaking of this new, um, this new world of, of, of uh, uh, consumerism um, at all, there obviously was a, a pretty powerful mail order economy by the 1920s in the United States. The dominant growth of, of consumption, especially um, involving cars, consumer appliances, uh, the kinds of things that required an electrified home, this was much more common in, in urban areas than in, in rural areas. Now, about uh, urban incomes, now urban incomes were not going down. Uh, they were not keeping, uh, the, the urban incomes of uh, working class and middle class families were not rising nearly as quickly as that of the wealthy. The 1920s was a period of enormous inequality in the United States that has not been matched until uh, perhaps the most recent decade in, in American history. Uh, but, you know, most people, most people in the 1920s uh, had a sense of, um, uh, of decent economic conditions. Um, their incomes were rising at, at a reasonable pace. The key thing is that many of these new products even if they were fabulously inexpensive compared to what they might have cost if they were available in any form 20 years previously, right? To buy an automobile in 1904, that was, that was something that only the wealthy could even begin to think about. Uh, even if the price of a good like that had come down enormously, a Ford that you could buy for a, a few hundred dollars, uh, um, for working class Americans, even for the broad middle class, that's very expensive. That is not a, a cheap purchase. So installment credit was a way to extend the capacity of a much wider number of people um, to, to buy. Someone brought up the question of rising stock prices. That might have been significant for, for some consumers, but keep in mind that uh, it doesn't, the best estimates we have suggest that no more than about 15% of families owned any stocks at all at the height of the boom in 1929. So, so it, one, one needs to be careful about, um, about drawing too close a connection between that development and the willingness of, of consumers to, to embrace these new consumption possibilities. Um, so how, how exactly did installment credit work? Let me say a couple of words about that. Um, in order to move these new products, Manufacturers and retailers, uh, department stores, they all recognized that they had to experiment with new forms of consumer credit, and, and they did so. Uh, uh, early forms of department charge cards would be one example. Uh, but I would want to stress the significance of entirely new financial intermediaries as well, uh, finance and loan companies, most important among them. So uh, it's not at all... I think a coincidence that uh, GMAC, the uh, the loan uh, subsidiary of General Motors, was created in 1919 um, to help sell automobiles, to to provide a mechanism for uh, for auto buyers to be able to finance this very big purchase. What's even in some ways more impressive, though, is that in the 1920s, there were 1,500 new finance and loan companies that came into existence in the United States, uh, driving the kinds of purchases that you see here for a, 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 a Corona typewriter. Those loan companies might be providing the financing to the manufacturer or to the retailer that they could then pass along uh, to the, the consumer, or they might have been providing the loans directly. Um, now, there, 
are a couple of ways that you can measure just how profound this reshaped the consumer economy in the United States. Let me offer you uh, uh, some statistical measures. Between, uh, if you take 1918 to 1920 as an average, consumer debt in the United States equaled 4% of income for the society as a whole. In 1929, that had more than doubled to 9% of income. Uh, in 1925, outstanding consumer credit was $1.4 billion. By 1929, it had more than doubled to $3 billion. Uh, uh, in, in that same year, $7 billion worth of goods uh, were bought on credit. This, is, this involved 60% of all automobiles, 80% of all radios. So that's one way you can, you can get this across, I think, to students. There are others. One would be to point out that an ad like this is clearly not something that's out of the ordinary. This is, the whole language of it presupposes that, that uh, the readers of the ad are familiar with this kind of thing that it's become a commonplace. Uh, or you might show students uh, a cartoon like this one. And uh, Richard, perhaps we could just um, uh, pause for a second and maybe you could read the, the text and we can have the uh, participants uh, think about the significance of this cartoon. Okay, teacher, what month of the year is this? Pupil, I know, December. Teacher, and who's coming to call at your house some night before this month is over? Pupil, oh, I know, the radio installment collector. Now, that refers to a question that we've had here in the chat, and basically it was, how did the installment plan work? They didn't have credit card numbers, uh, you know, and people, uh, they couldn't take money out of, out of bank accounts. So, uh, that refer, was it the honor system, the participant asked? So, I think this refers, this addresses that question, Ed. Yeah, so uh, for... If you were dealing with a very high-toned uh, consumer, it's possible they might have had a checking account. This would not have been the case for the vast majority of middle-class and working-class Americans in this period. So you're talking about face-to-face -face collection me methods, uh, people showing up uh, to, to collect, especially with things like radios or, in many cases, appliances. Uh, in other cases, uh, for, for those people who did have checking accounts, uh, you know, you would you would pay the way many people still do today, not on their phones, but you know, through through some type of payment app, but rather by putting a check in the mail. Um, the crucial element of the contractual arrangement here, and the reason why you had such an explosion of new finance companies willing to get into this game uh, to em embark on this uh, type of financial innovation, is the nature of the sales contract. So if you didn't make good on a payment, if you missed one payment, the loan company had the right of repossessing the item. They could come and they could take it away. Car, radio, uh, consumer appliance, what have you. Uh, and I think what this cartoon really gets across is just how ubiquitous this whole culture of, of debt had become by the mid-1920s. Uh, that's, that's, I think, what makes what makes the the comment of the, of, the, of the kid funny. Now, this uh, emergence of installment credit sparked enormous debate in American culture and politics. There's a huge amount of commentary about it in the 1920s, and I gave you a flavor of that with a 1927 article, uh, installment, uh, more light on installment selling. Uh, much of this commentary offered defenses of this new institution as, uh, as advantageous to uh, American uh, economic life. Uh, Richard, do you think you might uh, 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 read just the, the second two paragraphs there? Okay. Installment buying is the backbone of America's prosperity by leveling out the production curve. It has almost banished unemployment, creating more jobs through the increased production made necessary by the tremendous consumer demand. It has reduced the average cost of necessities and luxuries through quality manufacture. It has increased wages, encouraged thrift and ambition, prevented spasmodic business depressions, and made it possible for the wage earner of America to find contentment in the possession of those things which even the rich of other countries seldom can afford. So the, the claim here is that, it, that, that what credit provides is the entry point to that virtuous cycle associated with economies of scale. If you make it affordable enough for people to purchase these goods by giving them credit so they can spread out the payments, 
then you can you can sell enough of these goods to 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 have these incredibly productive forms of production. Then you can bring down the cost, make them even more affordable. That means also more wage earners producing them, and you have this virtual cycle of economic growth. Now yeah, there, we've, there's got, a, we've, yeah. got, we've got a number of questions backing up here. Did credit ratings exist at this period? Uh, they did for businesses, and there's an early development of consumer credit rating in this period as well, associated with the creation of, of all of these new products. Mm -hmm. It was woefully, uh, uh, they, were, they were really quite poor uh, uh, mechanisms initially. Okay, and was there predatory lending uh, during this period? Were people being taken advantage of by the finance companies? So, so um, in many jurisdictions, less so than would be the case by the 1980s and 90s after uh, <laughs> the removal of usury restrictions. Right, right. So you had, you had significant caps on the interest rates that you could charge in this period through the, uh, the legal lending market. There's, there's still loan sharking, right? Okay. Um, pawn shops even in this period, uh, and then, actually this is still the case now. If you have to borrow money now and you have no other way of doing it, you're going to get a much better rate at a pawn shop than you will from a payday loan outlet if the states don't regulate the latter. Okay. We have a question here about the Federal Reserve, but we'll come back to that if we have time in the end because I know we want to talk more about installment credit, and we, we do need to move on. We've got about 40 minutes. So, so there's also you know, a, a big disadvantage potentially in this in, in enormous expansion of consumer credit, which the article also makes mention of, but it it portrays it in 1927 as a minor complaint or a dissent, a sort of minor dissent from 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 uh, the more general celebration of this new uh, element of economic culture, uh, which was that this 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 installment buying and selling would, in the words of the article, cause the workman to pledge his future and place a mortgage on his earning power, which will tend to bring a reckoning day that will shake the credit structure should hard times develop, right? So it's a, it's a virtuous cycle on the way up, but what could it mean on the way down? What it could mean is the ripple effects uh, through potentially uh, the banking system if there are widespread defaults. That's what the, the person is envisaging. What, what actually emerged in the 1930s was something a little bit different, which is related to this legal process of, of repossession if you didn't make good on your payment. People didn't want to give up their car. They didn't want to lose their radio uh, or their, their prized vacuum cleaner. And so they made sure that, that whatever income they had went to paying those debts first and foremost. Well, what did that do to buying power? It, it helped to uh, uh, worsen the problem of insufficient demand uh, once, the, once the downturn uh, uh, really got going in, in, uh, in, in 1930 and 1931. All right, so uh, a second key element of this selling culture that I want to stress, uh, you might think of as, uh, and this is a little anachronistic because this is a term from the 1970s, but, but convincing people to embrace a new kind of lifestyle. You can see that in this uh, uh, department store window. What's going on here is an attempt to uh, fuel dreams of a particular way of consuming, a way of, uh, of, of partaking of, of Recreation, in this case, listening to phonographs or, or to the radio, uh, a particular way of being in the world. And uh, marketers and, and companies realized they had to show people how to do this. Demonstration was absolutely crucial. This is a, a selection from one of the essays that I suggested that participants have a look at before uh, the seminar this evening. Um, what I would stress about, about this, this particular uh, article is the way in which what's involved here is not simply demonstrating how something works, how an electric sewing machine works. Uh, you know, we don't have to use the foot pedals anymore. We can actually just plug it in. Um, but it's not just that. It's also about how to integrate new products into social interactions, uh, how to stimulate new kinds of consumer tastes, new practices, new dynamics of uh, of, of social relationships, new values and, and norms, uh, whole new identities for people are at stake here, and they're being sold along with the goods uh, and through the, the marketing mechanisms. And then, uh, very briefly, the third new feature of this selling culture 
has to do with what I would call a, a gloss of science. Um, the way in which thinking about selling, especially from the perspective of businesses, increasingly took a scientific cast, that you would approach the problem of sales, of, of getting rid of all of this productivity, the outputs of this productivity, as itself a body of knowledge that was um, amenable to scientific expertise. Partly that uh, that involved uh, the psychology of of motivation and consumer choice and the, the new discipline of, of psychology that was developing in the early 20th century um, in universities. Uh, partly it involved involved the analysis of selling methods and a, a, a rigorous kind of experimentation that would try things out and then assess what would work and learn from that. Uh, what's at stake here in part is, uh, and this, this cartoon from a business publication suggests it, is a way of trying to um, move authority from, from a different sort of worker, from salesmen, uh, to the people in the head office. The giant in this picture is in fact that home office, which has a certain mode of, of understanding the business world, a certain way of, of analyzing things. Salesmen now are really just people who carry out the very specific instructions of, of, uh, of, of the corporation. And the old-fashioned salesmen in the bottom of the picture, they're blindfolded, they're in the weeds, they're lost. The only person who's going to find that wonderful world of opportunity that sales represent is the one who is willing to get up on the shoulders of the, the headquarters and follow instructions. Ed, we um, have a question here. <clears throat> yeah. How aware was the public of the scientific selling? Did they feel they were being manipulated? Were they aware of that? That's a great question, and it's it's uh, in in one sense it would be hard to avoid it because it was it was the subject of of enormous uh, attention from writers. Uh, people are are producing uh, uh, commentaries about it in newspapers and in periodicals. On the other hand, a lot of the channel for that commentary was walled off to some extent from the broader public. So it's not as if there, there, there isn't attention to it from muckraking journalists. There certainly was. But, but a great deal of this commentary and the analysis is happening in trade journals that the ordinary citizen, the ordinary worker would not have had uh, any connection to. Or in treatises like these produced by new professors in new business schools at, at places like Harvard or uh, New York University or the University of Michigan, um, who are trying literally to put the stamp of science on what they're doing. Uh, and these, this whole approach to marketing and sales is really a crucial cornerstone of these new professional business schools associated with, with leading universities. Uh, and, and those developments were very much funded by the corporations that, that realized they needed to have a better sense of how to sell and they needed to be able to train their employees and how to think about that problem. Right, and would it be fair to say that this emphasis on scientific marketing uh, was a reflection of a broader respect for science in the 1920s? Was one of Absolutely, our no, qu no okay. question about it. Uh, and, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that, uh, actually, just just um, momentarily. So, so let's let's move now to the third big theme, which is the challenge of integrating uh, production and selling strategy and the way that helped to remake corporate organization, because it, it, it connects very much to this last question. So as we've seen, the, the crucial uh, starting point for this development had to do, occurred in automobiles, um, and the, the, so too, uh, the, the crucial developments with respect to mass production, so too did the uh, remaking of ways of integrating production and selling. And the crucial uh, field of battle here is between Ford and General Motors. Now, in, in the early 1920s, Henry Ford, pictured here next to his uh, beloved Model, Model T, uh, was the colossus of the American economy. He had pulled off mass production more, more uh, amazingly than anyone else, uh, creating this mix of standardized parts and also metal stamping using machines to create uh, 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 the pieces that would be produced into the car, 
and then using, again, a whole system of machines with the assembly line, creating this massive output. Ford produced only one product, the Model T, at insanely low prices comparatively, and he was producing hundreds of thousands of them. This was an amazing thing to people. Uh, so much so that, that there was this strong impulse to look to Ford as a, ma a magician who could figure out any kind of, of industrial problem. So, you know, wow, if we want to get coal produced more cheaply, who's the person to figure it out? Well, Henry Ford. And he, in fact, was doing that to some extent because he, he was integrating backward into supplies. And so he was, in fact, producing his own coal by the 1920s. Uh, well, he was, his, his, his employees were producing it. Um, associated here, and this is, this is linked to the notion of scientific selling, is this incredible ethos of efficiency. It's just dominating the society. On the left, you hear, you see Ford talking about this with respect to production. On the right, from one of the other readings that I had people look at, there's a notion that this is a, a, the same kind of value that should, that should be structuring the home life of families. Um, and so, you know, keep in mind, this is the moment when you have the birth of modern home economics. Uh, very same moment. So you've got scientific selling, scientific consumption, along with scientific production. Uh, now, there were some downsides, however, to Ford's approach um, that one needs to keep in mind. Uh, let me go back, back to this image for a second. So one product, no options, no variety. Ford was famous for saying you could have the Model T in any color you liked so long as it was black. So uh, I'm just curious if people have any thought about why uh, why Ford would be so uh, uh, stubborn about not having any options with his car. Why, why, what would be the, uh, the possible logic there? Okay. <clears throat> uh, why was he so stubborn about having one uh type of car because black dry black paint dries more quickly because he could standardization yeah that, that, i bet that's probably it he didn't want to have to vary uh the line for a whole lot of different cars so so mark and cheryl have the key thing and yeah. and and also and also mike you you're gonna you're gonna uh increase prices this is you're gonna have to have more complexity in the system and as a result you're gonna have to charge more this, this made no sense to Ford. He wanted to keep the price as low as possible. Now, so that's one de downside. The other downside I would stress is Ford's management style, which I think comes across a little bit in the, in the uh, article of his, uh, well, the article that he signed. I doubt he actually wrote it. Uh, he mostly worked through ghostwriters. Uh, but the, his management style was one of enormous autocracy. What he said went. He didn't want bankers to mess with him and tell him what to do. He didn't want any underlings giving him advice. His, his word was gospel. This, of course, meant there were no checks on his views if he might possibly make a mistake. It also meant that the company had, uh, the, the Ford had a problem in, in, in going in any kind of new direction, if, if anyone thought that would be important. Now, there were a number of car companies also in the in the market in the in the 1920s, although it had winnowed out quite a bit, there there had been a tremendous failure rate in the industry, as is the case with all new new industries. But the the most significant uh, alternative to Ford was General Motors. Uh, they had a very different approach to selling cars, suggested by these ads. So I'm curious what people in the what participants notice about these ads. Okay, what do we notice about the ads? <clears throat> Luxury uh, up there in the upper left, the Cadillac. Segmented, very good. Women. Women appear in these ads, so we know the target audience. <laughs> Lots of people notice the women. <laughs> Size of the ads, okay. Yeah, the segmentation there, I think, is the, is the key. And then the size of the car is not the size of the women. It's about people, not the car. And people of particular types. So it's not just the gender issue, that's really important. But also, if you look at the clothing, you'll notice people are not dressed exactly the same. Uh, the top one, the top ad, also quite, quite interesting. Where does this come from? This is a program ad from the Metropolitan Opera House for Cadillac. And, and here, who's driving the car? It's not actually the people going to the opera. There's a, there's a chauffeur. Whereas for Chevrolet, ah, 
you, you, you know, a, a middle class woman, no, uh, no problem in, in actually operating the car. It's easy to drive, easy to start, easy to steer. Um, what's, what's going on here is precisely this point that one, a couple people raised about market segmentation, about noticing that, that there isn't just one market for cars by the 1920s. There's the possibility of a multiple set of markets based on class differentiation, based on a variety of price points and features um, and, and fashion. Where, where at Ford, you can have a car in any color so long as it was black and it was always the same car. At, at General Motors, the notion was a car for every price and purpose. Now that did not mean a million different types of cars, but it did mean maybe 15 types of cars or eventually 25 and options at, within each one of those models. All of these things we're very familiar with now. They were new ideas then. The point here as well was to tap into social aspirations, the possibility of trading up from one brand, from one make to another. Um, and taking, at the same time, very close uh, consideration of consumer tastes, what people actually wanted, and looking to change the models every year to reflect those kinds of, of shifts. That's a fundamental reorientation of, of, of manufacturing strategy. Now, it's not as if there was no fashion before General Motors. It obviously existed in, all, in, in many, many segments of the economy. What was different here was bringing it into this newly emerging world of consumer durables. So that's one key point. The second point, which is absolutely crucial, is that what went along with this at General Motors was a new approach to corporate organization that involved a tremendous amount of decentralization. So what General Motors did, and partly this was because it emerged as a, as a series of mergers of other independent car companies, um, but what they did is they, they basically decided, okay, we're going to have each one of these divisions that makes a different type of car focusing on a different market segment. They're each going to have a fair degree of autonomy about how to sell what strategies they should use to sell, about figuring out what people in their particular market segment want and feeding that back into the technological uh, pri uh, process of developing new features uh, or moving uh, the car from one year's model to another. Um, there still would be a center, there was still a GM executive committee, and it would, it would decide who would run each of these, uh, of these divisions. And it would also provide allocations of capital so that they could, uh, they could do what they wanted to do, and it would veto some ideas as being beyond the pale. But on the whole, there was quite a lot of play for the people at Chevrolet or Buick or Cadillac to make decisions um, within the framework set by, by the center. There's a degree as well of, of federalism that works here, if you want to use that metaphor. Um, because the, the divisions also would send up representatives to the, to the headquarters uh, in, in Detroit who, who would then be part of the decision-making process about how to allocate things to the divisions. So this is a totally different approach from what was in place at Ford, that autocratic, one person has a say about what goes on. And it proved to be the combination of this uh, decentralized decision-making authority and the re representative mechanism for having a say in corporate strategy ended up being much more effective. By 1929, GM was making as many cars as Ford. Uh, it was making more, more than twice as many by 1937, was far more profitable. Uh, GM didn't look back uh, for the next 60 years. And we had a question about the arrows, the, the brown arrow, the arrows at the bottom of the chart. That, yes. That's essentially a legend, right? That means that the brown arrow going up from the uh, car division to the GM executive committee, that shows what information went to them, financial information and capital requests, and then flowing down from the committee, the blue arrow, capital allocations and managerial selection. So that's sort of a legend to the chart, right? That's correct. That's okay. exactly right. So, right. so the idea here is, you know, 
is, are things going well at Chevrolet? Well, how does GM know? They're not going to micromanage all the decisions, but they are going to get all of the accounting data about sales, about costs, and they're going to see whether the people at the top at Chevrolet are, are as profitable as the people at Oldsmobile. And if there is a difference there, they're going to try and explore it. And, and, and that might lead to nudging to a different policy or it might lead to a managerial change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, that's good, the way it works. But we have a good question here. <clears throat> well, we frame a question. So these managers sent from the divisions to corporate were like lobbyists for their brand, trying to get allocations for their brand over others within the same company. So are these divisions, did GM set this up so these divisions would compete against each other? Uh, in, in fact, yes, although they're also in many ways cooperating. So if they're exploring a, a fundamental new engine, moving some, from, say, a, a V6 to a V8 engine, that would be something that would most likely go on not just in one division alone, but with some collaboration. So it's not as if these these um, these divisions were hermetically sealed from one another. But in many ways, yes, they were. They were. They were. They were. There was a, a sort of tension between cooperation, uh, collaboration, and competition. Okay, we have another question. Did each of these brands begin as individual manufacturers? And they did. did. GM each grow by acquisition. They did. It was, and in many, and initially, it was sort of jammed together and worked very badly. What emerged in the 1920s was a way to incorporate all of these new uh, 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 fellow citizens of a of a single corporation into a, a workable framework. Okay. Well, shall we move on then? So let's move to the final theme. We've got 20 minutes left, so I'd like to try and do this last theme in about 10 minutes, and then we all have 10 minutes left for for more general questions. So this, this involves the enormous uh, 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 theme of business state relations. And I'm only going to offer one, one quick angle on this and one that I think is, um, is, is often uh, not emphasized enough in, in textbooks uh, and even in broader historical, uh, in, in higher level historical literature. Um, so, we tend to think of the 1920s as a time of cozy relationships between the government and business. And, and that's, abso that's absolutely correct, right? I mean, Andrew Mellon is Treasury Secretary right through the 1920s, one of the most important industrialists and investment bankers in the country. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, we, people make a lot of this quote that the business of America is business. Uh, there's a reason to do that. At the same time, I would really encourage people teaching uh, teachers who are uh, uh, thinking about the 1920s to avoid the concept of laissez-faire. So I really don't think it's the right metaphor. Uh, there's no question that the role of the government in, in structuring the economy was far less expansive in the 1920s than would be the case after the New Deal uh, and after World War II, but that hardly meant that the government was absent. Uh, for one thing, government at all levels played a huge role in various forms of promotion, of attempting to facilitate promote economic growth, uh, uh, in, uh, embracing uh, both formal and informal policies that would encourage investment and development of various sorts. So what was going on with, um, with the development of the oil industry, which was crucial to the emergence of the massive car culture uh, that was in place by the end of the 1920s. You got to power all those cars with with gasoline. Uh, well, the government's crucially involved here, selling leases to public lands, a whole set of other policies to facilitate getting oil to market. Uh, you know, the, one of the things going on in the 1920s, aside from the stock market boom, was a land boom, a massive increase in housing production, the, and a, a land boom in Florida. Well, this also was the result of a general boosterism on the part of uh, political officials, elected officials, but also many, many public policies, not least of which was facilitating the construction of railroads into Florida uh, to make it to make to make the boom really really move. Uh, so yes, yeah, so 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 the so the point here is that uh, there is a tremendous amount of promotional focus by by governmental officials in the 1920s, but it's also the case that there was a non-trivial commitment to oversight of the industrial economy. So if we look at these two quotes 
uh, these two segments of uh, of uh, uh, of the uh, speech, the campaign speech that Hoover gave in in 1928, just before uh, his his victory in that year. Uh, I think you might see perhaps some surprising dimensions of Hoover's uh, uh, political philosophy. In these quotes, and I think uh, rather than read them, I'm just going to make some comments about them because of time. Uh, you see here some interesting things, a commitment to the regulation of utilities, a notion that monopoly power is a problem, and there has to be some way of, of counterbalancing it with, with government regulation. That's interesting. There's also a desire on the part of uh, on the part of uh, uh, the the Republican administrations in the 1920s, and particularly on the part of Herbert Hoover, to stabilize industries in various ways. Uh, Hoover was crucial in sorting out the radio spectrum. There were competing signals that were that were basically keeping radio from from truly uh, uh, getting off the ground. The government sorted that out. Uh, he encouraged standard setting in a host of other industries, in lumber, in the emergent air industry, airline industry. Uh, there's a, a real focus as well on policing morality in the marketplace. It's not, I think, a surprise that the Republicans embraced prohibition uh, and, and, and pushed it through and kept it on, uh, in the Constitution right through the 19. 20s. This is the era that produced movie codes to govern behavior on screen, something that was very much facilitated by, uh, by government uh, actors, not just at the federal level, but also at the state level. Uh, it's, it's an era uh, in which government is trying to facilitate lots of different ways of uh, constraining the uh, actions of people uh, within given industrial segments. So what I have up on the screen right now is one way that, that this worked, uh, where the Federal Trade Commission would convene trade practice conferences in particular industries to set rules of the road uh, in order to try and, and uh, uh, streamline and, and make clearer what the uh, uh, precepts of fair competition were in, in given industries. Um, government also got heavily involved in facilitating another form of self-governance by the business community, and that had to do with a really wide-ranging war against business fraud in the 1920s. This is something that my own research looks at fairly carefully. So this is the era that the Biz Better Business Bureau really gets going, uh, both warning people about stock scams or consumer uh, uh, scams of one kind or another, but also seeking to police the marketplace. The, the Better Business Bureau had hundreds of, of people monitoring uh, 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 advertising and marketing strategies in this era, and they worked very closely with government. This is not going on somehow separate from government policy. They're working very closely together. The, uh, the picture next to it is of the National Association of Credit Men's uh, rogues Gallery. They, this is a group that, that had a uh, massive investment to try and police credit fraud through uh, the United States. Some uh, often uh, early forms of what we now think of as identity theft, businesses that would pretend to be other businesses and try and get credit from manufacturers or wholesalers. And we have a question here. <clears throat> yes. Were the trends we've been learning about more uniquely American or were there strong parallels in Europe, Canada, and elsewhere? Great question. There were parallels, particularly in some countries more so than others. So not so much in France, which had a, a stronger tradition of centralized governance, but uh, uh, many, many similar parallels in Germany, um, also in Great Britain. Uh, so, so this notion of having uh, businesses sort out the, the framework for modern economic activity was a more general process throughout the industrializing world, and perhaps the most powerful example of this in Europe were cartels, where firms would get together literally to set prices and, and, uh, and share market allocations, something that was much harder in the United States because of antitrust enforcement. That, that, actual, that point uh, leads quite nicely to um, the last uh, uh, quick point I wanted to make about uh, this emergence of self-regulation as a governance strategy, particularly government-facilitated self-regulation. 
There's also an undercurrent of criticism for, for these types of policies, um, which is, I think, nicely suggested by the article that I uh, uh, assigned from, from John Flynn, a quite uh, prominent journalist of, the, of both the 20s and the 30s. Um, Flynn's argument here, and again, I'm not going to suggest that you read it, Richard, since we're, we're running close to the end of the session. Um, his argument is that this attempt to create supposed codes of ethics as a, a form of self-regulation, a, a framework for fair competition, really often was nothing more than a bar to competition, a screen for the kind of price fixing that went on in European cartels, and also American ones that were not, uh, that, that didn't run afoul of, uh, that before they, they actually uh, uh, ran afoul of antitrust uh, uh, enforcement actions. Um, so, so there's this interesting, there's this interesting critique that emerged in the 1920s, which which had uh, really uh, has been quite enduring, looking ahead through the the last 80 years, uh, and actually has been extended by many uh, uh, economists to all re government regulation, uh, which is seen as little more than uh, uh, efforts to protect incumbent big companies from from the kinds of of competition that. Uh, that uh, they would rather not have to face. All right. Well, just really quickly, let me let me just sum up here um, by noting the way in which all of these four themes that we've looked at have some, inc I think, some incredibly interesting long-term implications. I'm going to actually just stress the three such uh, 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 ways in which the 1920s have cast a shadow over the the rest of American history. The most familiar, I think, is the saturation of selling in American life. Uh, just how ubiquitous advertising and marketing efforts have become to shape our desires and our choices as consumers. And along with that, the extension of consumer credit, whether that's credit cards in the 1950s and 60s or subprime mortgages and payday loans uh, in the last 15 years. Associated with all of that, I think, is also the more familiar uh, linguistic and cultural reach of, of, of sales and, and selling, the extent to which we all think about so many different issues in terms of branding, the way in which the individual has become not so much a citizen, but a consumer or a customer in so many different contexts. But let me stress as well two other really uh, extremely important uh, 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 ways in which the 1920s are, 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 have created Dynamics that are still very much with us, and then and then we'll hopefully have a, 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 at least some time for questions at the end. So these other two uh, uh, long-term implications both have to do with the nature of American institutions. The first has to do with decentralization in business as a mode of corporate organization, as a mode of strategy. Uh, the the mode that General Motors developed in the 1920s, along with other firms like Dupont became the most common way to organize major, uh, the, the, the biggest American firms by, by the 1950s and 60s. Uh, almost every one of the top 100 firms was organized as a multi-divisional corporation with this type of decentralization. And there was, beyond that, over the subsequent number of decades, a very powerful in inclination to further extend this impulse of decentralization. So you have the, the growth of the emergence of the conglomerate in the 1950s and 60s, where you have divisions that have nothing to do with one another. One might be car parts, the other might be uh, rental cars, a third might be frozen foods, all in the same company with this notion of having uh, uh, them doing their own thing, but then having this relationship to the center, which would give them capital allocations and would uh, select management for those different divisions. The second key point has to do with the depth of business self-regulation in American life as a mechanism of, of governing the economy. We just don't appreciate how powerful this approach has been. It was crucial in shaping many aspects of the New Deal, not just the National Recovery Administration, but the whole system of agricultural regulation was predicated on local committees of farmers who would set alloc uh, the quota allocations and would police soil erosion policies. It was absolutely essential in structuring securities regulation. So yes, you have the Securities and Exchange Commission, but its work would have been impossible without all of the things being done by accountants to set standards. 
by stock exchanges to set rules and police their members, uh, to, by ratings agencies and the National Association of Securities Dealers. All of these quasi-public, in many ways private institutions, had a huge hand in regulating the New Deal securities framework. Even after World War II, you see it with advertising regulation, which is done by an advertising council, much more so than by the state directly. Uh, you see it in accreditation. All of the teachers on this call work for schools that have been accredited. The same is true for anyone who works in a hospital. That's not done by the state. It's done by self-regulatory organizations. And there's been a massive expansion of this since 1980 in areas as various as nuclear safety, chemical safety, and environmental management. With that, I'll stop. We have six minutes for more questions. Um, Richard, I'm not hearing you. Okay, sorry. Here we go. Um, we that Some people are looking ahead to the... Uh, to the Great Depression here, question, does Hoover, as well as his predecessors, Harding and Coolidge, deserve blame for not seeing the economic problems that were on the horizon? Uh, I think the only answer one can offer there is, is yes, but one should keep in mind that it's not as if Hoover did nothing in the face of, of, of the, the downturn. Um, uh, and I'm thinking here not just of the constant calls for more confidence, uh, which had echoes not just uh, in the United States recently, but also more powerfully in Europe. Uh, he did take undertake steps to increase public spending, public public works. Uh, he did uh, undertake some mechanisms to try and provide uh, uh, credit reorganizations to uh, to people who were excessive, who had, who who were facing really crushing debts as a result of of uh, home mortgages, uh, and yet. At the same time, he couldn't quite get his head around the enormity of the problems. You should keep in mind that FDR ran against Hoover in 1932, in part by criticizing him for taking on too much debt, for having too big a deficit, uh, when, of course, the way out of the Great Depression was only through massive deficit spending. Right. Right. Okay, now, uh, we have some questions that uh, are still uh, on the table from the chat earlier. What about the role of the Federal Reserve in during the 1920s? So the Federal Reserve uh, basically facilitated all of this credit expansion by keeping interest rates fairly low. Uh, and it, it, that also dramatically facilitated the stock market boom that accelerated in, in the latter part of the uh, of the of the decade. So so that that dimension of of uh, stoking the boom also helped to set in place uh, the the conditions for for the eventual uh, uh, stock market crash and 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 later um, and later the collapse. But partly, what was at stake there was. Um, uh, a set of decisions by the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates after keeping them low for quite a while mm -hmm. uh, in the face of some international currency developments in, in 1928, 1929. So yes, the Federal Reserve has a very significant role. And then its unwillingness to cut interest rates after the crash far enough and quickly enough was, was, was very important as well. Okay. We had a question earlier <clears throat> that I didn't get to mention about African Americans during this period. Uh, were they marketed to in the selling revolution? Was there was were there many marketing efforts aimed at African Americans? Uh, uh, yes. Though the ones that were were you know so to some extent African Americans were partaking of of the new opportunities to purchase automobiles. Uh, or other appliances along, obviously along with the rest of, of society, uh, though not in as uh, uh, substantial numbers because of the income differentials that uh, the African American community faced as a whole. But in terms of specific marketing at African American uh, consumers, that was emerging most powerfully in this era by African American businesses. So if we were looking at life insurance and the marketing there, right. That's an area that was particularly uh, uh, embraced by uh, by African American firms because the mainstream uh, life insurance companies were just mostly ignoring that market. That's right. That's right. Well, right here in Durham, we had uh, North Carolina Mutual, which was for a time the largest African American financial uh, company in the country. I think. Ex exactly. 
Right, and here we have a question about trade associations. Were the trade associations of the 1920s sham or true efforts at self-regulation? Well, so I, I'm inclined to answer both, um, but you know it depends on the trade association. Uh, you know, if the if the what the trade association was doing was trying to uh, provide better information across firms, especially not not in the areas like General Motors where you had oligopoly and really huge firms, but rather like furniture manufacturer where you had hundreds, so that you would have mechanisms to share uh, best practices, uh, information about cost structures, so that firms could more productively produce, then they weren't shams. If you're focusing on uh, better export opportunities and, and collaborating to invest in uh, trying to uh, create channels for exports, not shams. Uh, if you're, uh, but in other areas, I would say that that uh, uh, what what they were up to was more like uh, uh, attempting to to limit competition than than to try and deal with substantive problems. Okay, we have time for one more question. You mentioned earlier that productivity skyrocketed during this time. How about employment rates? Did did were, were was unemployment low during this period or high, and if it was high, how much can we blame mechanization for that high unemployment? So unemployment in the 1920s was not a problem. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, you know, it was actually quite low, and so although manufacturing employment didn't, didn't really go up very much, you know, there's a, there's a big growth in consumer services mm -hmm. that's, that's arising here that's also associated with consumption. Right. Uh, so there, there are a lot of new jobs being created there. Um, so you know, you have, you do have, uh, to some extent, uh, technology replacing labor, but um, but much of that was just shifting it into into different sectors of the economy. I see. Okay, and we do have we're time for one more here. After experiencing the competitiveness and the competitive ruthlessness of companies like Standard Oil, I'm curious why the U.S. government changed its view to allow business to self-regulate. What changed? In other words, going back to our forum question, what happened to progressivism during the 1920s? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, in, in some senses, to progressivism, there's there's continuity because one of the things about progressivism is a faith in technocracy, a faith in expertise and experts. This, Embrace of science as a mode for making decisions, and that was that was embraced not just by businesses, not just by people trying to sell other people things. It was embraced as well by by policymakers and and individuals who wanted to shape uh, the the business of public policymaking. Um, there also, however, was was a recognition, a consensus uh, that was ratified at the ballot box in the elections of the 1920s. That one had to make a distinction between uh, uh, efficient big business that brought uh, advantages to society on the whole through economies of scale, and ruthless business practices that involved taking advantage of people. That involved taking advantage of people. And so, um, you know, Standard Oil was broken up because of the perception on the part of uh, the Supreme Court that it engaged too much of the latter, not enough of the former. Mm -hmm. um, but there was at the same time uh, unwillingness to break up United States Steel uh, or many other or many other firms uh, on, on the grounds that, that on balance they were they were furnishing more benefits than, than disadvantage to the society. Okay, well, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to thank you for your participation, and I want to remind you to use the forum to continue the discussion. We'll monitor the forum up until March 21st. We'll get back to you with your questions and comments. So let me thank Ed for giving us a really fabulous seminar. I learned a great deal, and I think our participants did too. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Richard. I enjoyed it very much. Okay, and I want to thank our participants once again for their intelligent and enthusiastic participation. I want to remind you to check americainclass.org for our upcoming seminars. Pretty soon we'll be posting our fall 2013 schedule. I think you'll see a lot of titles there that you'll be interested in. In the meantime, please submit your evaluations. Thank you once again, and good evening.